American Cult Christianity, Part 3. Why are there so many strange American cults today? The Assault on the Gospel Essential of Justification by Faith Alone. Hello, this is Joe Franklin, once again, of SparrowMinistry.com. This is a continuation of my new series on American cults and their beginnings. This ongoing and vital series called American Cult Christianity asks the question, why are there so many strange American cults today? Again, the short answer is the assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. Bottom line, a number of non-Christian cults and cults of Christianity were birthed during the Second Great Awakening in 19th century frontier America. All of these groups still infect the Christian church today with far too many Christians being unable to understand just what is it that makes these groups unorthodox, even destructive. Let's find out. Unbiblical theology and hermeneutic give birth to errors in doctrine and belief. You know, just like a snake and the, the, the adder has got some eggs that it's sitting on. And then those little legs grow up to be little adders themselves and their bite is venomous. So uh, the false teaching is in the soil of these churches. Uh, the root issue with problematic church teachings always comes back to hermeneutics applied rules of Bible interpretation. And so they're looking through, if you want to say rose colored uh, lenses or whatever the lenses and their color is, they're certainly not um, thinking uh, orthodox biblical thoughts. So they've got some dogma in there. And as I've mentioned before, Second Great Awakening, you had uh, Locke and Bacon and uh, rationalistic thought, Scottish Enlightenment, and all that fog of error that came out of the Second Great Awakening, uh, picked up by uh, the Stone Campbell Scott uh, founders of the Churches of Christ, and uh, put out into this stratosphere there, um, and we're still dealing with that today. Biblical hermeneutic approach, scripture interprets scripture, that's how it's supposed to be done. And we'll use that to interpret confusing or complex passages based on the clear passages. And we see a fruitful tree on the right and a pretty barren one on the left. Here again are the underlying reasons of groups who, for whatever reason, can't seem to embrace or understand the gospel religion. Just to recap what we've learned thus far, this video series is helpful to anyone coming out of a restoration movement group, especially the Church of Christ and the Seventh-day Adventists. Together with the International Church of Christ, that's the group that I came out of, they all share a set of beliefs that are outside historic Christianity and time-honored creeds. As I have stated throughout this series thus far, the heresy that these groups share is called conditionalism. They deny that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And as I said before, justification is a fancy word for salvation. They are all involved in a work salvation scheme. They all reject the historic Christian gospel. The finished work. When we are saved, sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. The perfection that comes from Jesus' sacrifice has no end, even though those who have been made perfect are still in the process of being made holy. Think about that for a little bit. What makes us perfect is not what we do, but what Jesus did on our behalf. His infinite perfection cannot be stained by our imperfections. If we have put our trust in Jesus's death to pay the penalty for sin, 
we can be confident that sins from our past, our present, and our future are forgiven all because of the perfection of Jesus' sacrifice. That's Lauren Berg, thelife.com. Really cool. Good job, Lauren. I couldn't have said it any better. And so we've talked about some doctrinal errors of restoration movement groups in parts one and two. Here we're going to talk about the atonement and justification a little bit. Christ's work of atonement was fully completed at the cross. John chapter 19, verse 30. He then took his seat at the Father's right hand. Restoration movement groups enslave and scare their members by teaching that Jesus' blood sacrifice forgives and cleanses us from past sins only. One can fall in and out of salvation or an approved status with God based upon adherence to the moral code set before them by church leadership. It's called yo-yo Christianity, and I did that for many years in the international churches of Christ. Oh, I was a disciple great one day, well, not the next. Shared my faith with somebody, and then I didn't the next. And then I went up and down and down and up, and boy, I tell you, really unhappy. The biblical response, nowhere in the Bible will you find justification as a process. Justification, now we're moving on from atonement to justification here. They're connected. Justification is a fancy word for salvation, as I just said. This not guilty but righteous blessing, justification, comes to us freely by faith alone. Romans 3.28 and many others. And it is always depicted as a one-time event. No yo-yo. Yo, no yo-yo. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, having been justified through faith. In other words, this grace is a past event, God's work for us. It's a done deal. Sanctification, however, is a process of being made into the image of Christ. That is God's work in us. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. This process will continue until one is taken home by rapture or death. Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. And we see in the depiction up there, the priest uh, offering sacrifices. They say back then that a priest was <laughs> a glorified butcher. And of course, it's more than that. But there was a lot of blood Jesus lives and is glorified, and he sits at God's right hand in a power position. Satan is a defeated foe henceforth. The battle is won. It is finished. Sins have been forgiven, if you're a Christian, past, present, and future. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, and then 14. But it's never finished in the cults, my friend, because they don't trust grace. They reject eternal security. Well, you can lose your salvation any moment with them. So churches that abuse teach that Christ's imputed righteousness is not a finished work or a done deal. No finished here, Jesus. We've got more stuff to do. They refuse to understand Hebrews 8 through 10 and the chapters there. Of course, they would never uh, use such direct language. They have him standing in heaven and still somehow sacrificing on our behalf instead of sitting and resting. And that is just what works righteousness or pseudo-Christianity teaches or implies. 
that one must polish the apple by their acts of obedience in order to be acceptable and made perfect with regards to God's will for their holiness. Christians, however, do not do good works in order to obtain the new birth or get to heaven, which might be fine if justification is an ongoing process related to one's deeds. No, we are doing good works because we are already in Christ and because we are already saved with the righteousness of Christ imputed by faith apart from works that we do. Orthodox salvation theology says one is saved, justified, or not guilty but righteous, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, with the righteousness of Christ imputed to our accounts as a forensic done deal. All other systems, workarounds, and schemes of men will steal your joy and wreck any chances of living out God's will for your life. Attempts at self-sanctification point to an even more ominous error that the practitioner may not have been born again and is without the Holy Spirit. Recall that in part two of this series, we learn that restoration movement groups believe Christ is said to save by furnishing man an example. He simply showed man how to save himself by Sabbath keeping, dietary restrictions, baptism, patternism, being a disciple. The lie is that your obedience somehow infuses or imparts Christ's righteousness with grace filling in the gap here and there. They are trying to blend the Old Testament law system with New Testament grace. Roman Catholic justification theology, that's what we're talking about here, folks. Stairway to heaven. And it ain't, it ain't pretty. It ain't like the real stairway to heaven that I grew up with. What was that? I don't even know who did that one. Anyhow, you're never really saved in the cults. No eternal security. Seventh-day Adventism, uh, Seventh Adventism and the International Church of Christ omit or sweep under the rug imputed righteousness. Even when speaking of being saved by the righteousness of Christ, Adventist writers refer to imparted righteousness, seldom to the biblical concept of imputed righteousness. That's Timothy Oliver uh, of uh, the Watchman Fellowship. It says off, but it should be of. And I had asked uh, an ICOC kingdom teacher, they call them kingdom teachers, uh, an author, really, really, really smart guy, to explain their doctrine on imputed righteousness. And you know what he told me? He told me to ask the mainline churches of Christ, I kid you not. The ICOC does practice a kind of Roman Catholic justification theology of infused righteousness. Never saved. It's never finished. Jesus is still on the cross, or he's still up in heaven somehow, advocating for us and forgiving us, I guess. And so I examined uh, the top 10 ICOC, air quote, Bible studies to find one vague reference to imp imputation, and their doctrine is literally void of Christ's completed and finished cross work. Mainline Church of Christ is also fu fuzzy, folks, on imputed righteousness and hold to the error that there is no original sin. Keeping someone from knowing who they are in Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Contributes to their work salvation scheme. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Omitting this important doctrine sets people up for potential abuse because they are never good enough. They are setting up the spiritual equ equivalent of a battered wife syndrome. Justification, not guilty, but righteous. And they forget that second part, the but righteous part. 
So the ICOC will go on and on and on about the bloody death of Jesus. And it's true. Excuse me. But, uh, boy, they don't want you to know that you're, by faith, justified, not guilty, but righteous. Justification involves both a negative and positive viewpoint. Negatively, justification is the removal of guilt from the offender, forgiveness. Positively, justification is the addition of righteousness to the one who trusts in Christ. Romans 5.17 this is called the great exchange. Paul describes this grace in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Cults confuse, omit, or simply deny that Christ's righteousness is imputed to the believer as a forensic legal declaration at the moment of saving faith. And Paul spells out justification in Romans 3.24. This is the central theme in Romans Chapter 1, verse 17, a righteousness from God. And that 117 verse is the central theme of the entire book of Romans. And the cults just don't want to let you know that. Once again, churches that batter and spiritually abuse their sheep teach that justification is an ongoing process related to one's deeds that the righteousness of Christ is merely imparted or infused. This confusion or confusing of justification and sanctification is a hallmark of restoration movement groups and similar cults of Christianity who hold to Campbellite beliefs. I've written about the ICOC's unbiblical justification theology in the 2019 ICOC report, Taken Captive, You'll find that material in the theology section 1.2 and 1.3, and that's where I quote some of their top uh, leaders on the subject. Omitting the grace of imputation is a major control tool for restoration mu movement cults. It sets the practitioner up for failure as they will simply be unable to meet the group's rigorous expectations for acceptability and making it to heaven. They go on and on about that in the cults. Boy, you got to make it to heaven. Boy, you better obey the Sabbath and dietary rules, ICOC. Boy, you better do all these things that we tell you about being a disciple if you want to make it to heaven. And Church of Christ, Patternism, and, and Lord's Supper, and you go on and on and on with that group. The idea they are left with, this is the practitioner, is, uh, is called chasing the carrot of God's approval. Chasing the carrot. And here we uh, have a, uh, a graphic here. We saw the slide in part two. At the very top, using fear, obligation, and guilt, knowingly or not, abusive churches omit teaching the grace of imputed righteousness making it easier to hold salvation over your head. If you knew you were, you were already perfect in Christ the moment you were saved, why then would you fall for this conditional salvation scheme? Well, you wouldn't, and they know it. This is their scheme, folks. Positively, justification is the addition of righteousness to the one who trusts in Christ. The perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to the believer, and he or she is justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Negatively, justification is the removal of guilt from the offender, forgiveness. Sins from our past, present, and future are completely forgiven. So you can see real clearly there, if you get it wrong on that one, boy, I tell you what, you're going to be chasing the carrot and you're never going to be happy or effective. So we again, uh, we saw the slide in part two, and I spoke about con uh, contracts and the fact that insurance companies, and when you sign a lease, ag lease agreements and whatnot, they don't tell you what is covered and what isn't. I mean, they'll make a few points here and there. But they are intentionally vague in that regard because they know you wouldn't sign if they disclosed the truth up front. Full disclosure. Uh, uh, uh. Same with deceptive restoration movement cults who mask their real identity and practice deceptive recruiting practices. Bondage pastors are really false teachers masquerading as angels of light 
and servants of righteousness. They are especially prevalent with restoration movement groups, in my view. Their sales pitch sounds orthodox, even biblically correct, to the unprepared. Authentic biblical Christianity has always maintained that faith expresses itself in action. Protestant leaders such as Martin Luther and John Calvin taught that while good works could not in any way merit salvation, they did prove in a demonstrative sense the genuineness of the individual's faith. Said the reformers, we are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves us will never be alone. It will always be accompanied by good works. So by omitting this grace of the cross, cults leave their flock chasing the carrot of God's approval. Adherents left with the false belief that they must polish the apple by their acts of obedience in order to be acceptable and made perfect with regards to God's will for their holiness. This makes the narcissist leading the narcissist leading the church in charge of getting to, getting to heaven. Now they're in charge. They're going to tell you how to get to heaven. And they are easily able to scare and scar and abuse God's blood, blood-bought children. How sad. All in the name of obedience, of course. So the ICOC took that patternism of the Church of Christ and applied to uh, applied it to their misunderstanding of discipleship. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Restoration movements uh, groups believe that Jesus gave mankind these patterns for acceptable religious behavior and showed us how to save ourselves, which is basically man-centered. A lot of information there. Justification, being forgiven, not guilty, is not enough. God's standard for holiness is the perfect righteousness of Christ, not our obedience. You can try to be as obedient all you want. It's not going to meet God's standard for holiness. Christ's righteousness in that he was perfectly obedient to God's law and a sacrificial death are now credited to the repentant believer as their own. They cannot lose this not guilty but righteous standing because God does not change. They must persevere, but justification is not a process related to one's deeds. Their salvation is secure eternally, eternal security. Bible teaches, teaches that. And their identity, who they are in Christ, is fixed and immovable. They say those two things, eternal security and our identity in Christ are that soft feather bed that the Christian is assured of and can rely upon. Not so with the cults. And finally, their confidence or assurance may fluctuate from time to time, but they cannot lose their justification based upon works. So, and as I uh, just mentioned a few slides ago, the ICOC's indoctrination, air quote, Bible study program makes no mention of imputed righteousness with few exceptions. I only found one. They are literally teaching only half of the cross of Christ. They hit the crucifixion really hard with loads of grisly detail in order to evoke more emotion and works from the candidate seeking to be baptized. Once they teach the seeker that baptism is for the remission of sins at the time and the time, moment, and place of the new birth, the bedraggled and guilty person jumps at the chance to accept this false light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, with their will broken and their ability to think critically undermined at every turn, they accept the ICOC's rules-based discipleship program and other idiosyncratic teaching and surrender their will to the group. How could anyone ever live up to God's perfect standard, which is Christ, the perfect lawkeeper, by our own righteous deeds and commitments or obedience? God grants us the righteousness of Christ through simple trusting faith and his perfect sacrifice and his obedience. 
Restoration movement cults are practicing a form practicing a form of Pharisaism. Okay, next slide. Cults omitting imputed righteousness. Omitting imputed righteousness is diabolical and destructive. Here you see on the right there, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that passage is known as the Great Exchange. Uh, he, I'm not sure I can quote this because it's kind of crap, but anyhow, he who made, who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Sorry about butchering that, but uh, you can look it up yourselves. The Apostle Paul said that salvation does not depend upon anything within oneself. 1 Corinthians 1.30 That is why we can only boast in the Lord. Verse 31 It is by faith alone that we are declared righteous. Salvation springs from the free grace of God. Romans 3.24 it's unfortunate that Christian writers have to further describe grace by placing the qualifier of free in front of the word. But legalistic restoration movement groups like the Church of Christ and the Seventh-day Adventists have made it necessary in order to protect the essence of the gospel, which is justification through faith alone and Christ alone by grace alone. You'll also encounter lordship salvation groups that overemphasize repentance to the point of front-loading the gospel with works. You'll hear them spurn and disparage free grace by either incorrectly defining what evangelicals teach or erecting straw men in order to knock them down. Bottom line, salvation is a gift. It's, it's free for us. And it's free for those who trust in Christ, but it cost our Lord greatly. Seventh day and ICOC, wrong baptism theology. The SDA on baptism. This is interesting. Baptism also, now this is a quote here from uh, raptureforums.com, SDA on baptism. Baptism also marks a person's entrance into Christ's spiritual kingdom. It unites the new believer to Christ. Through baptism, the Lord adds the new disciples to the body of believers, his body, the church. Then they are members of God's family. SDA's uh, Believe, uh, that's a belief statement, page 182, 184, 187. The ICOC on baptism, baptism is the time, moment, and place of salvation. When immersed, the person is born again. They come into the baptistry dead in their sins and separated from God, only to come out of the water regenerated, a new creation. That's baptismal regeneration on both those groups with slightly different wording. The biblical response Romans 3, 21 to 26, verse 28 as well. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and 23, verses, uh, 23 and 24. Chapter 5, verse 1, Galatians 2, 16, 3, 26. Five verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. These passages make it abundantly clear that salvation is entirely by God's grace alone, apart from any works with the righteousness of Christ imputed as a done deal and not just imparted over time or infused. Our faith does not save us, but appropriates God's grace to save us. Both of these quasi-Christian cults teach that the new birth occurs at baptism. Their doctrine is one of baptismal regeneration or baptismal re remission. These are not Christian teachings. Christian baptism is a believer's baptism, an outward sign or symbol of an inward grace. We're not justified before God based upon what we do. One's own works, baptism 
obedience, Sabbath keeping, praying Jesus into your heart, tithing or prayer will not justify anyone. It is God's grace through faith. It is a gift. An evangelical Protestant theology, faith alone, sola fide, is the instrument of regeneration. Reformed theology, the Heidelberg Catechism, and other great confessions say this. We are grafted into Christ and receive all the benefits of God's blood-bought children by faith alone. So faith alone, apart from sacrament or ceremony, appropriates God's grace and causes the believer to enjoy all the perks of salvation. Praise God. The individual must be born again by the Holy Spirit. The new birth happens by the written word of God and by the creative work of the Holy Spirit through the power of regeneration. The Holy Spirit alone, and not the whims and schemes of men, is sovereign in the new birth. Beware of groups that tell you that there are a bunch of steps to ob obtaining salvation. The Church of Christ practice what is essentially the same baptism theology and we have the Church of Christ founders, Campbell, Stone, and Scott, and the Second Great Awakening to thank for it. This is a really great slide, and this is super important. This might start bringing some things together um, for the viewer. Error here is Jesus is the new law giver and not the perfect law keeper. That's the error, and that is a lie from the devil. You must prove your loyalty to God and meet all church criteria to get to heaven. This is this kind of thinking here, folks. Salvation is very fragile in restoration movement groups. People are held in bondage to fear and works. Cults devalue Jesus' finished work on the cross. It's never finished with these guys, especially imputed righteousness. They see Revelations chapter 14, verse 12, as a mandate that we must obey all the Bible as a rule book. Scripture says that God's commandments are that we walk in love. 2 John, verse 6. John, chapter 15, verse 12, and then verse 17. Remember that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He is now our righteous standing by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and then again in chapter 3 verse 24. Excuse me. Still have my cold here. Here is a fundamental misunderstanding about God and his will for our righteousness coming out of the false set of beliefs piped out by the restoration movement. All restoration movement cults of Christianity have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and snookered by the idea that we can live the Christian life by implementing various man-made man religious behavior patterns. The law was put in place to lead us to Christ, who is now our perfect sacrifice. The law is a shadow and schoolmaster. But cults of Christianity hold to an old covenant paradigm. They are, tempting, they are attempting to be saved by what they do, works, a do and live model which is represented by Mount Sinai. The new covenant believer, however, is being empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit with Christ on the center of the throne, a live and do, which is Mount Calvary. Restoration movement groups are asking the law, acts of obedience and strict adherence to rule keeping, certain religious behavior patterns, they're asking the law to do something that works and law works are incapable of doing. Law can't save anyone. By omitting the imputed righteousness of Christ as a done deal and a one-time event at the point one exercise of saving faith, they are attempting a Plan B, or My Way, righteousness program. 
Paul warned against this in Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 and Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Cults of Christianity will publicly state that righteousness is by faith from first to last, but their definition of righteousness and faith is not biblical. You have to define terms when speaking to someone coming from a restoration movement group. Biblically speaking, we are made righteous positionally by faith in Christ as a one-time event. Restoration movement error is that through their own obedience, they are righteous. Jesus is simply not enough for them. The gospel often the gospel is often defined in terms of what a person must do to be saved. Obey the gospel. This puts the focus on man instead of Jesus and violates the fourth sola, Christo solo, through Christ alone. Salvation is by faith, and I might have mispronounced that, but salvation is by faith in Christ alone and his atoning work apart from individual works is all sufficient. The law giving Christ of the cults is not the authentic Christ of the Bible, but rather a different Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. This is interesting now. The Restoration Gospel to-do list for salvation. This is their to-do list here. For salvation. They reject eternal security and do not understand the indwelling Holy Spirit and the new birth. Of course, neither do the Adventists or the ICOC. And this is a, um, an extended kind of uh, excerpt here from Bob Ross, absolutely an expert theologian and historian on the Churches of Christ and the International Church of Christ. You'll see him with various YouTube uh debates and so forth uh, on, on the YouTube channel. Great guy. You'll see him on Christian Answers TV as well. You can Google that with Larry Wessels. So anyway, here, here are all the rules that you got to follow and hopefully be saved one day. The restorations, restorationist plan of salvation in which if you obey, you will be saved in heaven after this life. Remember, no eternal security, forgiven of past sins only, yo-yo Christianity. Hear, plus believe, plus repentance, plus confession, plus baptism. That's the first set of rules. And that's a, a baptismal regeneration, by the way, which is not a biblical teaching. Plus local congregation, plus Lord's Supper on the first day, plus giving on the first day, plus singing, non-instrumental, of course, get rid of that piano, that organ, and all the other stringed instrument, plus prayer, plus benevolence, plus Bible study, plus no creed, plus Bible name, plus the second law of pardon, plus obedience to the elders, plus good morals, plus no Christians and other denominations better not ever get together with those doggone, you know, free grace people, anyone who believes in, in that, plus scriptural marriage, if married, plus whatever the evangelists preach as the word of God. And that's Bob Ross. I love that. It's so true. Attempting in part to be saved by works, patternism, and baptism seems so noble and praiseworthy to the undiscerning, but it is sheer buffoonery. I mean, just look at that picture. It's pretty sad. The Church of Christ sees the Bible as a rule book and has atomized the various commands within the 66 books as a new legal code and moral rule book. They can't see the forest through the trees and their old way thinking. The same stands true for the Seventh-day Adventists and the ICOC, as I said. The ICOC have added even more rules to these criteria and look to discipleship as their higher order Christi Christianity template. Their patternism and hope of salvation comes in the f form of discipleship. Go on and on about discipleship. 
of course, as Kit McKean understood it. The group, uh, the groups, these groups tout the notion that their quirky and legal, legalistic discipleship is the missing ingredient. Actually, it's not these groups, it's the ICOC as a group. The missing ingredient and somehow places them above their brothers and sisters, but it only feeds their prideful elitism. This is about religious captivation and slavery here. Let's look at the picture. Great slide here. Work salvation scheme. You are never really saved. Boy, you better walk that tightrope. And so the blue boxes from left to right, the atonement is devalued. Now, this, these are the teachings here within restoration movement, cults of Christianity. The atonement is devalued. Chris, Christ's blood work only forgives past sins. No eternal security, no safety net when you fall. Yo-yo assurance because of legalistic restrictions and other traditions. No imputed righteousness, only works righteousness. In the middle there, they hold to Roman Catholic justification theology. Cults teach that justification is a process and not a finished work or done deal. We must maintain our not guilty but righteous standing through keeping the rules. Transactional view of God, impure motives. That's the result anyhow. Phoniness. Religious, uh, religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. The gospel says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Tim Keller on the gospel of grace. That's great. And again, we're talking about two different um, Calvaries, uh, Mount Sinai, law works, or Mount Calvary, which were anchored in grace and living under the controlling power of the Holy Ghost. Restorationism appears evangelical, but behind the deception is a set of beliefs a set of beliefs here um, that holds people to the mythology that they are the only true church, that yet they have no assurance of salvation. Go figure. So when sanctification, a process, and justification, one-time event, are confused, it takes away from the sheer spectacle of the cross, and it robs the Christian of the sure foundation which they are to build upon. Restoration movement groups teach or imply that justification is a process and not a finished work. Again, that's Roman Catholic uh, justification theology codified in the 16th century Council of Trent. Since Jesus Christ is the center of God's plan and grace is that plan, this is the only sure foundation that one can build. We must hold to orthodox justification theology and not seek to supplement his sacrifice and or finish work. If we do, our works are not wrought in Christ. This person has a misplaced faith and a false religious zeal. I'm speaking about spiritless religion or man-centered religion here. The gospel of grace is about a righteousness from Christ. Again, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. And trusting in his perfection and perfect obedience. No amount of obedience can meet God's standard for perfect holiness outside or above Christ. This holiness is ours by faith alone with genuine works stemming from that great assurance and foundation. This scheme slide depicted here, shows how cults utilize the inherent fear, obligation, and guilt that comes with a graceless gospel to control their church members and use them to their advantage. Cults, an inconvenient truth. And warning here, there's an assignment at the bottom of the slide. Oh no! Well, being that I was a teacher for many years, I'm going to have an assignment. So this is not just about harping on people and, oh man, stay out of the cults and I'm going to teach everyone about the cults and this and that. This is about spiritual abuse prevention and recovery. And I want to help everyone avoid these groups altogether. That's why there's an assignment at the bottom. Question, why do some people, why do some Christians unfamiliar with cults and sects 
fail to see the value of defending the historic Christian gospel. In other words, why can't we all stop fighting each other and just get along? Hey, the answer is they have a shallow understanding of the Christian gospel. Answer is they have a worldly or man-centered point of view. They want to please men and avoid conflict. That's my nature, folks, to be a people pleaser. That's one of the reasons why I joined the International Churches of Christ. I knew something was wrong. But I went ahead and did it anyhow. People pleasing. Doctrine def divides. Roman, Council, Roman Catholic Council of Trent, 16th century, calls those who hold to the Reformed Gospel heretics. <laughs> That's the sixth, ses sixth session here. So that's why we need to defend the Christian gospel. Imagine that. I am a heretic, according to these folks, because I believe that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from works with the righteousness of Christ imputed. Man, okay. Another answer here of why we just can't get, you know, why can't we all just get along and let's just gloss over this stuff? Why, why does there have to be this tension and a battle? Answer, they do not understand theology basics and the central doctrines of the Bible, especially the doctrine of justification by faith alone. These folks don't understand how a person is saved. So this is the inconvenient truth. Assignment one, our Daily Bread University, theology definitions. And uh, obviously you can't click this because uh, it's a... Uh, it's not it's not a clickable feature, but we'll we'll get to the uh, the link in the next slide. So here's the theme of the entire series on American cults here. Poor understanding of basic Christian doctrine, hermeneutics and theology give rise. Uh, uh, hermeneutics and theology they all give rise to apostasy. That's the theme. This is the bad soil that bears inevitable bad fruit and leads millions of souls away from the Christian faith. Despite the ecumenical, can't we all just get along spirit that has greatly influenced evangelicalism over the past 20 years, discerning Christians must still pay attention to theology and contend for the faith. That's Jude 3. Roman Catholic theology says that righteousness is eternal is internal this is really important it says that righteousness is internal it's in the human heart that you are made inward inwardly just made inwardly just catholic official catechism paragraph 1992 the biblical response is that by faith in christ and his substitutionary atonement the believer is counted righteousness and you are inwardly just these two viewpoints, made inwardly just versus you are inwardly just, these two viewpoints are incompatible according to Romans chapter 3 verse 24 and 2 Corinthians 5:21. We must have the courage to call apostasy apostasy and false teaching false teaching. Restoration movement cults of Christianity are denying the gospel of Christ and they are denying imputed righteousness as a forensic legal term or one-time event. Denying righteousness imputed means that God somehow doles out grace as he sees all the good works that we are doing. This transactional, this transactional view of God denies what we know about scripture and what it teaches on what just justification really is. Life is about decisions. One must choose. We are either made inwardly just, with righteousness being a processed go process governed by our works, or that we are inwardly just, a present reality with the righteousness of Christ imputed at the point of living faith. And so uh, there's your assignment. Really easy and it's short. You'll love it. And so here is the assignment and the link, uh, theology definitions assignment, https colon backslash backslash christianuniversity.org forward slash courses forward slash theology dash basics forward slash. 
And uh, you can just speak that right into your mic and Google it if you like. Our Daily Bread, it's a really great, great uh, quiet time book uh, booklet that my wife and I have been using for years. And you just make a don donation and they'll send, keep sending them to you. They're really great for quiet times. And uh, this is a part of their um, ministry here. It's uh, Our Daily Bread University, Theology Definitions, you'll see right there. And that's what the screen will look like, folks, when you uh, you hit that link and you type it in manually. Um, again, this is not a, a, a an automatic link. So you can pause the video and tab back after looking at this brief, brief lesson. I purposely chose something that was super basic. Um, Search for systematic theology once you get to that uh, link, and you'll see a very short and concise PDF called Theology Definitions in which to op open. It's a PDF. Recall that uh, restoration movement cults twist Bible definitions to make room for their work salvation scheme. It's important to unlearn their propaganda in order to start anew and be made whole. So it's about uh, spiritual abuse prevention and recovery. We want to learn from our mistakes. And we want to help others that are stuck in these groups too. Okay, so here are some cult, uh, cults root causes, root causes. Now, now that you've looked at that PDF, we can start talking about some other things, the theological eras. I found this really interesting. You've got Armenian th theology uh, with the emphasis on mankind's free will and salvation. It's a counter to the tulip and Calvinism. So a lot of these movements and, 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 and uh, eras are overreactions or reactions to the perceived weaknesses that they thought at the time um, classical and um, Protest, uh, classical uh, the, uh, the Armenian theology uh, is fine, by the way. It's not, it's not a heresy. Um, even Wesleyan, but the ICOC and Lordship Salvation groups go far beyond classical uh, and Wesleyan Armenian theology, and they go straight into front-loading and back-loading the gospel with works. So Armenian theology, it's important to know that. Biblical theology is a historic method uh, in understanding the truth. Within the books of the Old and New Testament, scholars prefer this method as it rep respects context and author intent. A Reformed theology, 1517 to 1750, we know about the, the Reformation, uh, make up the Reformed Calvinistic s segment of the Protestant Reformation. They embrace three theological principles, sola scriptura, scriptures are our highest, highest authority, sola fide, uh, 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 gratia, justification is entirely by faith through grace, and the priesthood of all believers, uh, Martin Luther and evangelicalism. That's a, a big uh, a, a hero there in, in, in uh, evangelicalism as well. And uh, let's see, continuing with our theme. So here I'm going to make some comments uh, on this uh, uh, cult's root causes. This is a continuation of our theme, which stresses the importance of theology and understanding basic Christian doctrine. Recall, recall that the cults prey upon ignorance. And so there you have it, whether it's from our Daily Bread University or other evangelical leaning websites and authors, one does not need to attend Bible college or be an expert in order to understand some of the basics pertaining to the eras and what viewpoints are out there. A word of caution about the Churches of Christ and the ICOC. They do not believe in any of the five points in Tulip or Calvinism. They are quick to erect straw men and disparaged disparage Reformed theology and lump that together with the Protestant Re Reformation. They throw this whole era out as some kind of cheap grace experiment, and here is why. They don't want you looking at the fact that they embrace the same heretical theology that other restoration movement groups hold fast. This belief is outside the box of orthodoxy in historic Christianity. The heresy that these groups share in common is called conditionalism. So straw men, red herring, don't look over there. You know, don't look at what we're doing. Boy, you know, 
So they deny that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They are all involved in a work salvation scheme. The solas, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, that's just three of them, are the bedrock of the Protestant Reformation and should never be thrown out for expediency. Sovereignty versus free will is complex, and I'm not going to tackle it. I believe in a little bit of mystery, and humans simply cannot know everything. God alone knows who is saved. Again, restoration movement cults of Christianity do not look at the eras honestly. They have tons of straw men arguments. And again, red herring, deflection, and other uh, root causes of the cults. Contemporary theology have beliefs sourced in the Enlightenment or Age of Reason, that 1650 to 1750. Starting in Europe, scholars sought to reform church by rejecting some historic creeds. And that's the, the fog of error that you have uh, with the uh, Stone Campbell Scott movement, Churches of Christ, who apparently or at least claimed to have restored the church in 1811 and then uh, discovered the ancient gospel in 1823 and then implemented it in 1827. The Killer Campbellite uh, virus and unlocking that 11, 23, and 27. Impact. This is where the American cults rejected the Bible doctrine of justification, how we are saved. Works righteousness and legalism versus imputed righteousness led to negative, pro, uh, negative slash positive reinforcement. Transactional view of God, externals were in, and floaty esoteric faith were out. Mourner's bench versus baptism. And I have not explained that. But anyhow, uh, that's what came out of the, the fog of this error is visible checkoff list uh, type stuff. And the heck with that floaty, you know, justified by faith and all that kind of stuff with the righteousness of Christ imputed. Now, we can't have that. Boy, you better get on the bandwagon, get on that treadmill and start doing all kinds of visible works. So the Church of Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Millerites, uh, later to become SDA, uh, and International Churches of Christ, this is their root cause. They're anchored in contemporary the the theology, uh, that era. And they dismiss the other errors. Straw man arguments, again, is what they're going to turn to. Worth noting is that the Restoration Movement takes its cues from the very anti-theological period of contemporary theology. Thomas and Alexander Campbell were heavily influenced by Scottish Enlightenment. They were Scot-Irish uh, immigrants and spurned both historic creed and salvation by grace through faith apart from works. They looked instead to Francis Bacon and John Locke and forced scientific reasoning upon the scripture, which resulted in a reasoning and a viewpoint that literally discredited scripture. Anything floaty or esoteric was out and was replaced by a man-centered hermeneutic. And that's the command, example, and necessary inference. CEI, the lie of CEI. External acts of obedience like baptism were distorted and given sacramental qualities. Folks began coalescing around the set of beliefs piped out by the restoration movement of the 1800s. This was a, a time of increasing apostasy. And so this is a picture of E. Grand Grandison Finney. You'll, you'll hear Finney, the father of modern revivalism, a uh, famous uh, evangelical Baptist Methodist uh, uh, preacher. Um, and there you see the mourner's bench. The way of the transgressor is hard. So, and repentance obviously is um, important for salvation. Uh, there is no salvation without coming to saving faith, which includes a uh, belief and trust and repentance. Those are two sides of the same coin. So this is a very biblical type of, um, I guess, tool uh, that they used back then. Uh, I made a little reference to operant conditioning, 19th century uh, with Finney. Um, 
you know, the mourner's bench, anxiety seat uh, for confession and repentance was problematic, but not outright heretical. Some false conversions, certainly manipulative. Uh, I think it's a little operant conditioning because you're saying, well, it's kind of, well, you know, you sit at that bench and you get sorry for your sins and you get prayed up and then uh, and then you're ready to, of course, accept Christ. And, you know, prayerfully, uh, you really and truly have come to saving faith and trust in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit would graciously regenerate you. But I just uh, think that there's a little operant conditioning in there, kind of a this for that, you know, do this and you'll get that. I, I don't like that that uh, the, the the mourner's bench for that reason, but it's certainly not heretical and a repentance is, uh, uh, you know, necessary uh, for, for uh, receiving Christ. So the Christian church thrived during the 19th century. So this is some good news here. This is the Christian church. It thrived during the 19th century. An innovative preaching and many conversions were had by traveling ministers such as E. Granson Finney. It is important to remember that Bible-believing groups such as the Presbyterians, Baptists, Lutherans, and others did not fall into apostasy like the Church of Christ, Adventists, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Also know that I am not putting cults of Christianity in the same boat as the Mormons and JWs, for they are a false religion altogether and do not have the Holy Spirit. They deny the deity of Christ and the Godhead. So more of this uh, operant conditioning. Uh, eh, I think it was a part two. I talked about uh, Freud and uh, Skinner. And uh, Skinner was into that operant conditioning. Uh, you, you recall learning in high school maybe about Pavlov's dog, which was conditioned to respond to a bell. 19th century, the, the Campbell's restoration movement, innovative, uh, their innovative idea was baptismal re remission, a heretical teaching that altered how we are saved. So this is, you know, I might have some problems, you might have some problems with the mourner's bench, and that's a little too forward and a little bit too in your face, but this is a heretical teaching now. And if you'll see on the right, Alexander Campbell is a key founder of the Churches of Christ. There were a couple other others there, and you'll see the big crowds wanting to be baptized. So uh, Campbell was a Scot-Irish immigrant and originally Presbyterian. The Redstone Baptism Baptist Association booted Alexander Campbell for his heresy. Campbell quit before he got fired. And then he claimed the true church was restored in 1811. He then claimed baptism, which is a work, as part of God's plan of salvation in 1823. His evangelist, Barton Stone, an anti-Trinitarian, preached this false gospel starting in 1827 and called it an ancient gospel discovery. If it's new, it isn't true, and if it's true, it isn't new, said a great theologian, and I can't remember his name. So sheep stealing from evangelical churches by frightening believers with the notion that they weren't really saved and needed to be further instructed with this ancient truth, well, that was commonplace. The proof text they use, and still do today, by the way, they use incorrectly, is Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 19, chapter 1, verses, uh, chapter 1, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, sorry. Pre-Christian baptism, that was John's baptism, is being confused with believer's baptism. And they also came up with the McGarry heresy of baptismal cognizance. So there you have the crowds, uh, you know, Finney and, and the various conversion, uh, true conversions that were going on back then. Well, the <laughs> restoration movement comes along and starts scaring the you know what out of people saying, well, listen, <laughs> this baptism, that's the only time you can be saved. And you haven't been baptized with the right understanding and all this kind of stuff. Well, you're not really saved. So naturally, everyone is flocking into the waters under the uh, auspices of this new teaching. So uh, what we have here is uh, these blind guides and apostates have embraced a subtle error which stems from an idea. 
God helps those who help themselves. I am what I uh, produce. These are, these are demonic ideas. I am what I produce, in terms of the faith anyhow. I am justified by faith alone, plus the many works of obedience that I do. Up by the bootstraps and do it yourself. Satan offers these false ideas and his servants sell them as being from God. Every New Testament book, aside from Philemon, as far as I know, contains warnings about false teaching. The Apostle John speaks of a telltale sign of the false believer. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. And that's 1 John chapter 2, verses 19. Notice all the moving around that uh, this uh, Church of Christ founder did. Uh, Presbyterian, then uh, some association did some writing for the Baptists. They're fixing to boot him, so then he goes off and he starts another sect. True believers should pray for discernment, contend for the faith, and make no apology as they combat false spiritual authority that threatens the church. Campbell, Stone, and Scott, together with William Miller and later Ellen G. White, did not completely abandon the faith, but rather rejected the Christian gospel and the salvation that goes with it. This departure is still apostasy and deserves the condemnation Paul delivered to the Galatians in chapter 1 by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These bondage pastors often masquerade as servants of righteousness and come from within the church unnoticed. Their teaching spreads like cancer. There are about 20 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world today and about 4 million churches of Christ. 800,000 of them are residing in the U.S. who are hardliners, non-instrumental hardliners. Okay, the carnival of the flesh. Born in sin, come on in. Well, this is one carnival that I'm not really interested in. Been there, done that. Uh, welcome to the carnival, my way religion. I did it my way. Did God really say justification by faith alone apart from works with the righteousness of Christ imputed? Yes, he did, folks. It's all over. There's many scriptures that uh, tell of that. Genesis chapter 3 is when it all began. And so, Satan tempts us with ideas. We just talked about them. Up by the bootstraps. No floaty esoteric here. And uh, I am what I produce. Man, that's a free grace. How could it be? God would never give away salvation for free. You got to do something for it, don't you? you guys, some works. I mean, come on now. Just a little. I mean, you know, just saying. No, folks. It's a free gift. That's what the Bible says. So Satan tempts us with ideas, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, and does not approach mankind with a full frontal assault. Apostasy will, will, will merely get worse as Christ's return draws near. Cults of Christianity have embraced subtle error. They are theologically correct on most major doctrines of the Christian faith. So if you're wanting to say, well, there it is, here it is, man, there it is, we finally got them, there it is. It, no, not with the cults, not with the cults of Christianity. Two ways to live a holy life. Number one, by our own power. Or two, by the power of God. I'll take not the former, but the latter. Flesh versus spirit. Again, we've got two covenants here. We've got law and flesh, that's Mount Sinai. Old Testament, or I'll take Mount Calvary and uh, the Spirit, grace. Seduction, bite of the apple. You want to take a bite? No thanks. Legalism is a quick fix and a shortcut not to live by faith, which is trust in God. And that's the tack that uh, Campbell, Barton, and Stone took. No floaty esoteric here. No mourner's bench. Skip that stuff. Let's just go right into the baptistry. But to do it, you're going to have to come up with a brand new teaching on salvation and become an apostate. Well, they did it. And now we're still cleaning up the mess. 
Attempting to be saved in part by what you do is an illusion. That's because salvation is an unmerited gift. Once upon a time, Rumpel says, magic always has a cost. And that's Paul said something similar in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1. Who has bewitched you? There's always a cost for short, shortcuts. Again, the restoration movement is a set of beliefs or ideas that promote a subtle error. Those caught up in the work salvation scheme introduced by Stone, Campbell, and Scott do not realize the seriousness of, of attempting the Christian life in their own strength outside the gospel of grace, justification by faith, imputed righteousness, and the Holy Spirit. To them, it seems normal. Just follow the pattern, and everyone else has somehow got it wrong. Somebody wrapped up in work salvation will, off, will off, often excuse me, be in strong denial that they are earning or meriting anything. They frequently use language such as, I am being obedient, and will employ language used by evangelicals, such as grace, the Holy Spirit, and love for others. All restoration movement cults of Christianity practice thought reform or psychosocial manipulation. By default, somebody caught in their web of religi religiosity will not recognize they are being manipulated. They get very dismiss dismissive and dis defensive when the term thought reform or mind controls enters the conversation. But whoever controls your conscience controls your behavior. It's really hard to admit to oneself that we can be hoodwinked through false religion, scripture twisting, or someone that's used a spiritual club on us, and we just, we just don't see it as something that's dangerous or harmful, a departure from the faith or false doctrine. Anyhow, it's a necessary step, however, to reaching full recovery and wholeness is understanding thought reform. Satan's number one trick, folks, people may depend fully on Christ to obtain salvation, but afterwards they embark on some form of works righteousness. Galatianism is beginning with the spirit, but then trying to be perfected in part by the flesh. Galatians chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, verses 1 through 4. And we've talked about that a little bit. The Judaizers were only asking the Galatian Christians to follow two pretty noble rules, circumcision and ceremony, some food, food, food rules, table manners. That was it. It wasn't that they had to do everything. Oh, they might have liked everyone to, you know, the, the Christians there to return to full Mosaic law, but just two rules were being asked. Justification. It is not your own righteousness, acts of obedience, that does it. You receive this righteous status by faith in Christ alone. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. This does not depend upon any works that you do to earn, merit, obligate, acceptability in God's sight, even after you are saved. The cults insist on dutiful obligations to their own criteria and attach salvation to completing them. This is another gospel and sheer legalism, making non legalism meaning making non essentials mandatory. Sabbath keeping, ICOC style discipleship, Church of Christ patternism. Baptism for the remission of sins, headdresses, snake handling. I think you get the picture. Galatianism is the most prevalent sin within the Christian church today. It is a very subtle error that often gets overlooked because those who ascribe to it are doing good deeds. We tend to look down on the individual who is abusing grace and living a sedentary, 
life while turning a blind eye to groups that promote works righteousness or works salvation. Both of these sins, however, are simply two sides of the same sinful nature coin and equally miss the mark. That's right. All the restoration movement cults of Christianity, including the International Church of Christ, are enmeshed in the terrible error of Galatianism. What makes dealing with restoration movement cults of Christianity even more complicated is that their practitioners were indoctrinated into obtaining salvation apart from the gospel of grace to begin with, and their whole foundation is askew. That situation is quite different than Paul's letter to the Galatians, because the church there had responded to Christ and received salvation apart from works and baptism, and were born again at the preaching of Paul. In other words, they came to Christ empty-handed. Martin Luther once said, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. The great error of the restoration movement is that they attach salvific repercussions to certain works as either necessary for obtaining salvation and or in making it to heaven. In doing so, they show a profound misunderstanding of grace and the nature of salvation. Last slide, and this is a summary here of parts one through three. Congratulations, you made it thus far. This is a recap of American cult Christianity and the material we have covered so far. Here is a demon figure that is scary and easy to identify. So, summary, American cult Christianity, parts one through three. Bullet points, top to bottom. Cults of Christianity exploit those unfamiliar with the Christian gospel. They appeal to human nature and the flesh. Prideful elitism, works righteousness, extra biblical teachings, up by the bootstraps, no floaty esoteric here. Systematic theology is important for every Bible student. Biblical or historical theology is preferred by scholars and respects how doctrines were developed and formulated over the years. Cults perpetuate the notion that all of Christianity went apostate after the death of the apostles and suddenly woke up when they came onto the scene. They are historyless in that regard. A lot of cult mythology there. Cults dismiss the theological errors, especially the Reformation, to fit their narrative that they discovered and restored the ancient gospel. Again, all kinds of straw man arguments and red herrings. That's what you'll hear. Cult Prevention 101 is adopting an orthodox methodology for understanding the Bible. That's one of our themes. There are many evangelical scholars that are sound in doctrine. Theologically and historically, we have to label Second Great Awakening new religious movements as cults. Again, we've got two non-Christian and two quasi-Christian cults. They deny the Christian gospel saved by faith alone. We're talking about the Stone Campbell Scott Movement Church of Christ and the Millerites who became the Seventh-day Adventists. Cults omit or confuse teaching the full gospel, specifically what the Bible says about Christ and his righteousness imputed. They look to their own works of righteousness instead. Finally, cults confuse justification with sanctification. They do not believe justification is a forensic legal blessing, but an ongoing process dependent upon more and more works. So anyhow, this recap is here. And I was, as I was saying, the demon figure is scary and easy to identify. But not so with the subtle teachings of American Restoration Movement cults who do not deny most of the Christian doctrine and theology. Realize, too, that these churches have accepted these unorthodox beliefs and practices as church tradition now. They don't know that their own group's history, uh, outside the mythology of the group, they don't know about it, 
outside the mythology of the group, excuse me, and they just accept it as a, some kind of special church teaching. And all that is contained within. That's just the way it is, they might say. So they don't know their history. It's tradition now. Many are simply going through life on autopilot. I know I was when I was in a cult. They are experiencing spiritual stagnation and a massive power outage in their faith journey. Their, may, their faith muscles have atrophied. Just follow the rules. Obviously, much more could be gleaned from parts one through three of this series, but that's it on the topic of American cult Christianity, part three, and why there are so many strange American cults today. Thanks again for viewing, and be sure to check out my website and ebook series on the International Church of Christ at www.sparrowministry.com or order the books directly from Amazon.com or from my Amazon.com author page. They are also available on Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, and Rakuten.